Thank you very much for the invitation to address you and to give a lecture on Christianity, Sigmund Rhee, and the division of Korea. It's always a delight to speaking to Korean audiences about Sigmund Rhee. It can be a bit lonely being a Sigmund Rhee scholar in the United States, as there is frankly not very much interest in Rhee here, and my wife is certainly sick of me talking about him, so I'm very glad to have another audience to present to. Now in the 30 minutes that I have today, I can just barely scratch the surface of what I would like to say. But what I'm going to cover, the vast majority of what I'm going to cover, is in my book, Foreign Friends, Sigmund Rhee, American Exceptionalism, and the Division of Korea. So if you're interested in anything that I have to say, I encourage you to check out that book. I apologize that it is currently only available in English, and it is very expensive in the Republic of Korea, but I'm hoping a Korean edition will come out shortly. So in the time I have today, I just want to make three points, okay? And they're points related to Christianity and Rhee and the division of Korea. So the first point is the role of Christianity in Sigmund Rhee's political career. The second point is the role of Christianity in the division of Korea. And the third point is how an understanding of the history I'm going to cover can possibly be a source of hope for a society that is riven by partisan divides and conflicts. I'm going to give the second point at the request of the organizers at this conference. As a historian, I'm somewhat skeptical to use history to draw lessons that are applicable to the present, but I have been asked to do this, and after some reflections, I think perhaps there is something helpful that I can say. So first, the role of Christianity in Sigmund Rhee's political career. I love speaking to Korean audiences about Sigmund Rhee because generally I don't need to go over a lot of background and give a whole biography. I think you are probably aware of the general outlines of his career. So what I just want to do in addressing the role of Christianity in Sigmund Rhee's career is to make three observations that I think might be interesting to you. And those are that Rhee's embrace of Christianity was instrumental that Rhee's conversion to Christianity got him off the Korean Peninsula, and that Christianity provided Sigmund Rhee with a strong base of support in the United States. So the first observation is that Rhee's introduction to Western education and Christianity were the result of personal ambition and not of a deep intellectual or spiritual curiosity. Rhee sought out Western learning quite simply because he was ambitious. As you know, Rhee spent more than a decade of his life as an adolescent and a teenager receiving a Confucian education, preparing to take the Quago examination in the hopes that he would join the bureaucracy of the Chosun state. When the exam was abolished and that avenue was no longer open to him, Rhee and other ambitious Koreans began looking for new avenues through which they could advance. And Rhee sought out Western learning at a place called Peje Hakdang because he was ambitious, because he hoped a Western education would be a path for him for personal advancement in the future. It's important to understand that. It's also important to understand that Rhee did not convert to Christianity at Peje. And this was an embarrassment to his missionary teachers, such as Henry Oppenzeller and others, who recognized that Rhee was very talented and that Rhee was truly coming to understand and support Western ideas of individual liberty and freedom. But throughout his time at Peje, Rhee considered Christianity somewhat of a ridiculous religion. And Rhee only converts to Christianity after he is imprisoned in 1897 because, of his, because his reform attempts against the Chosun state have failed. And Rhee converts to Christianity at this time both as a means of personal spiritual regeneration and also national regeneration. His conversion prayer, as is recorded in several of his books, is, O oh God, save my soul, save my country. Rhee's relationship with Christianity was very instrumental. 
I think Rhee was certainly a devout believer in the Christian faith, but his Christian faith was never divorced from his Korean nationalism. And this is why I think Dongnip Changshin, The Spirit of Independence, is such an interesting and important book. Rhee urges Koreans to reject Confucianism and embrace Christianity, not because one is true and one is not in an objective sense, but because Rhee believed that Christianity could lay the foundation for the regeneration of the Korean nation in a way that Confucianism could not. Okay? Rhee's embrace of Christianity was very instrumental. All right? That doesn't mean that he wasn't a devout and sincere Christian, but his motives for embracing Christianity were complicated, to say the least. The second observation I want to make is that Rhee's conversion to Christianity was essential to his political career because it got him off the Korean peninsula. Rhee is one of the few Korean leaders who will not have to make the agonizing choice of whether to support Korean nationalism at the expense of his own prosperity and safety and that of his family, or whether to support Korea's independence, because he is off the Korean peninsula for almost the entire colonial period. And it's his conversion to Christianity that makes this possible. American missionaries in Korea recognized Rhee as a very talented and ambitious young man. They invested a great deal of social capital in him in the hopes that he would become a Christian. And once Rhee does convert to Christianity in prison, they invest even more heavily in him. They ensure that he survives in prison. Without their gifts of food and warm clothing and medicine, it's quite possible that Rhee would have died, as many prisoners did. They also lobby hard for his release in 1904. And once he's released, they use their networks in the United States to secure for Rhee an excellent education in the United States at George Washington University, at Princeton and Harvard, with the understanding that he will return to Korea as a Christian leader. As you likely know, Rhee travels to the United States in 1904 after he's released from prison, both on a diplomatic mission, but also on a religious mission. His diplomatic mission to secure American support for Korea's independence through appealing to the 1882 treaty is a failure, although this is no fault of Rhee's. He is actually surprisingly successful at getting an audience with Roosevelt. He doesn't understand that Roosevelt has already decided to support Japanese colonialism, however. So his diplomatic mission is a failure. His religious mission is much more successful in that it gives him a very strong education for religious purposes. Finally, my third observation is that Rhee's Christianity provided him with a strong base of support among American Christians. While Rhee is in the U.S., he gets not only an excellent education, but happens to be active in Korean circles at the time of the Great Pyongyang Revival, or the Pyongyang Debuhong of 1907. And overnight, Korea goes from being a backwater to the fastest growing American mission field in the world. And Sigmund Rhee is well placed to explain to Americans what is happening in Korea. He becomes a prolific lecturer in the United States and a spokesman for Korean Christianity. Rhee and his American Christian supporters, many of them returned missionaries, understood the power of a story. And Rhee had a very powerful story, both of his education at Peje, his imprisonment, and his conversion. These were the kinds of things that audiences at this point really wanted to hear. Rhee could argue plausibly that Christianity had not only saved his life, but saved his soul. And it's for religious reasons that places like Princeton and Harvard are willing to give Rhee nearly full scholarships to do his PhD. It is religious interests, much more than political ones, that sees Rhee frequently invited to the home of Woodrow Wilson. And it's for religious reasons that Wilson becomes something of a mentor for Rhee. In the United States, at least, Rhee was a religious leader years before he was a political leader. American Christians would be Rhee's most solid base of support throughout his long career in the United States. It's important to understand that Rhee's relationship with the U.S. government and American officials was frequently very difficult. 
because Ri often wanted them to do things and to take action for Korea that American officials did not believe were in American interests. Ri's support among American Christians allowed him to frequently pursue goals that were absolutely contrary to American policy, such as he did in the spring of 1945 and during his release of communist POWs during the Korean War. He did so without damaging repercussions because American leaders feared a backlash from Ri's American supporters, from Ri's American Christian supporters. We cannot understand Ri's political career without understanding his conversion to Christianity and how this conversion opened doors for him politically. It's vital to understand why Ri converted to Christianity, how Christianity got him off the Korean Peninsula, and how American Christians became a solid base of support for Ri for decades to come if we're going to make sense of his political career. I want to move now to talk about the role of Christianity in the division of Korea. If the Great Revival of 1907 made Americans care about Korea religiously, the March 1st movement made Americans care about Korea politically, or at least somewhat politically. Prior to 1919, very few Americans cared about Korea politically, and those who knew much about Korea generally favored Japanese colonization because they believed that Japan was in fact more civilized than Korea. This changes after the March 1st movement when the Japanese respond to the peaceful protest by massacring more than 7,000 Koreans and imprisoning and torturing many others. The violence is an important part of changing American minds, but also important is the idea that Japanese are not just suppressing Koreans politically, but they're suppressing Korean Christianity. Publications like The Little Martyrs of Korea reinforce the idea that Japanese are condemning Koreans as Christians. The fact that much of the news regarding the March 1st movement also comes to the United States by the way of American missionaries reinforces the notion that Japanese are suppressing Korean Christianity. Christians mobilize to have their government intervene to support Korean Christians and in some cases Korean independence after the March 1st movement. Between 1919 and 1922, American Christians are especially active. In 1919, Sigmund Rhee and Philip J. Sun and some American supporters found the League of Friends of Korea, which by 1922 will boast 25,000 members in 14 branches across the United States. Dozens of American missionaries and Korean converts to Christianity go on the Chautauqua circuit to give lectures on Korea. And if you don't know what a Chautauqua lecture is, it's the equivalent of TED Talks in the era before radio and televisions. Chautauqua speakers would travel from town to town with a big tent and a production crew. And it's important to recognize that speakers did not get placed on the Chautauqua circuit unless they were very good communicators and unless they had an issue to talk about that would draw a crowd and fill a tent. The fact that so many Korean speakers were on the Chautauqua circuit during this period speaks to the importance and the interest that Americans had in the Korean issue. My research indicates that between 1919 and 1922, perhaps as many as 200,000 Americans, mainly in the Midwest, heard a Chautauqua lecture on Korea. Over 7,000 newspaper articles on Korea were also printed during this period, and I have yet to read one that was not sympathetic towards the Koreans. American Christians placed pressure on their congressmen to do something for Korea. I cannot cover their activities in much detail here, but Korea actually becomes an important issue in the debate over the Versailles Treaty in the United States Senate. And a reservation to the Versailles Treaty calling on the U.S. to recognize Korea as an independent state comes just seven votes short of passing in the U.S. Senate in the spring of 1920. Now this reservation would have ultimately been of little use since the U.S. Senate 
ultimately fails to ratify the Versailles Treaty, if the United States never joins the League of Nations. But it is evidence of how important the issue of Korean Christianity and the Korean independence movement had become in the United States after the March 1st movement. This period also sees Ri transformed from a religious leader into a political leader in the United States. Ri is elected as president of the Korean provisional government, the Dehan Minguk Im Si Chongbu, in 1919. And while this government is not officially recognized by the United States, Ri's status as a political leader is de facto recognized by many American Christians and a few American political leaders. This lobbying changes American hearts and minds regarding Korea. After the March 1st movement, very few Americans are willing to accept the notion that Japan is more civilized than Korea and that Japanese colonization is something the United States should support. However, American policy does not change. The U.S. government has neither the will nor the ability to confront the Japanese over Korea. And this situation would continue until just before World War II. It's in the late 1930s when Sigmund Rhee begins to recognize that the U.S. and Japan are likely on a collision course and writes a really amazing book called Japan Inside Out. Now this book is not an explicitly Christian book, but it does make a moral argument. And Rhee argues that if Theodore Roosevelt had not, in Rhee's opinion, betrayed Korea in 1905 by failing to come to Korea's aid, Japan would never have repressed Korean Christians and would never have been able to use Korea as a springboard to attack China and to spark the, the Pacific War. Re argues that Roosevelt's actions will eventually come back to haunt the United States because the Japanese will not be satisfied with China. Sooner or later, they will attack the U.S. Re calls on Americans to repent and to recognize that they have a responsibility as the leading free nation in the world to defend freedom abroad. Japan Inside Out gets a warm reception in the United States and goes through two printings in the summer and fall of 1941. When the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941, Rhee is transformed overnight from a rather obscure religious leader, a voice crying in the wilderness, to a minor American celebrity and something of a prophet. Rhee spends the war years lobbying Americans, especially American Christians, to pressure their government to support Korean independence by recognizing the Korean Provisional Government in China, or the KPG. He founds Protestant and Catholic organizations to champion Korean independence, and the boards of these organizations include luminaries such as Peter Marshall and Bing Crosby. Marshall is not so well known today, but he is essentially the forerunner to Billy Graham in the 1940s. He will have an Oscar winner winning biopic made of him in the early 1950s. He is America's pastor at this point. Bing Crosby is easily the most famous, the most celebrated American entertainer of the 1940s. Rhee also appears on national radio in major newspapers and gets to meet many famous and influential Americans, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who writes about Sigmund Rhee twice in her nationally syndicated My Day column during the war. He meets Albert Einstein, Fiorella LaGuardia, Wendell Wilkie, among others. Rhee is very active during this period, and you can see the full details of his lobbying in my book and just who he was meeting and the kind of arguments he was making. His lobbying is effective, but Rhee cannot persuade the U.S. government to recognize the KPG and to give Lend-Lease aid, which is what Rhee really desires. American officials are sympathetic, but they worry that recognizing the KPG might start a rivalry for control of Korea between the Soviets, the Americans, and the nationalist Chinese before the war against Japan is even won. They explain to Rhee that they are not unsympathetic to the Korean cause, 
but they cannot risk shattering the Allies' unity over the issue of Korea. They write the Cairo Declaration as an attempt to placate Rhee and to commit the United States to Korean independence after the war. But Rhee will not be satisfied until the KPG is recognized. And in desperation, after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies in the spring of 1945, Rhee alleges, with no real factual evidence, that Roosevelt has made a secret deal with the Soviets at the Yalta Conference selling Korea out to communism. Now this sparks outrage among American Christian leaders in the US and they pressure their congressmen to do something for Korea. These Americans believe that the US is now appeasing the Soviet Union as they had previously appeased the Japanese. Several congressmen speak out on the Korean issue in June and July of 1945. They make clear that American Christians are demanding that something be done for Korea. And they make clear that there will be political consequences for the Truman administration if President Truman does not do something to prevent Korea from falling into a Soviet sphere of influence. The Truman administration is under political pressure from many sources to guarantee Korea's independence in the future. But there is a problem. As the Japanese are surrendering, American troops cannot get to Korea in time before the Soviet Union overruns the entire peninsula. Furthermore, American military leaders want nothing to do with Korea. They claim that Korea has no strategic value to the United States and that they have no plans for an occupation of Korea, that they are not prepared to occupy Korea in the post-war. Before the 38th parallel is a compromise between the Soviet Union and the United States, it is a compromise between American military leaders and American political leaders. The military leaders want none of Korea. The Truman administration wants as much of Korea as it can get for domestic political reasons, especially to protect it from American Christians who believe the U.S. must not sell out a Christian Korea to communism. Now, there were many factors that led to the division of Korea, and Sigmund Rhee's lobbying and American Christian support were not the only factor. Had the Japanese held on and fought for three more weeks, the Soviet Union would have overrun the entire peninsula, regardless of what the United States did and regardless of pressure on the Truman administration. If the Japanese had surrendered three weeks earlier, it's quite possible that maybe the Americans would have occupied the entire Korean Peninsula. A number of things had to happen in just the correct sequence for Korea to end up divided in the post-war period. But it was the political pressure on the Truman administration brought by American Christians and Korean lobbyists that gave the Truman administration the desire to push that something be done for Korea. Finally, I want to discuss the implications of the above history on current Korean political polarization. And I've been asked to address how this could possibly be a source of hope for a society in pain and in conflict. So like most historians, I am skeptical about using history to find lessons for the present or using history to guide our current behavior. However, I sincerely believe that an accurate understanding of history is almost always preferable to an inaccurate one. And in that sense, I think it is important to understand that the division of Korea was not the result of evil people. Korea was not divided by militarists, by political opportunists, by ideologues, or even by capitalists and communists. Korea was divided because of the collective action of tens of thousands of people, most of which were just like you and me. People who looked around the world, who saw injustice, and who mobilized to try to make it right. Dividing Korea was never what they intended, but their actions were nevertheless a crucial part of the context in which that terrible decision was made. It's important to keep in mind that good intentions 
and a desire for justice do not necessarily lead to good outcome. And this should be a cause of humility for all of us and a cause for us to view historical actors with empathy. And I believe that empathy is one of the few sources of hope for societies facing extreme polarization. It is unlikely that people on opposite sides of political issues can be persuaded to change their minds. But empathy makes mutual understanding and compromise possible. I know that Sigmund Rhee and his actions are at the heart of many of the current debates polarizing South Korea. Rhee is a very polarizing figure, and I have found that Koreans I talk to either love him or they hate him. And I sincerely believe that there are good reasons to do both. His lifelong devotion to the Korean independence movement and his role in shaping the Korean constitution and the ROK were remarkable achievements. His actions during the Korean War, especially the Bodo Yeonmeng, the Bodo League massacre, and his refusal to surrender power until it was taken from him are grave failures by any measure. There are reasons to love Ri and also reasons to hate him. However, empathy and an accurate historical understanding of the context in which Ri made his decisions will help us understand that Sigmund Ri, like us, often faced choices he would have rather not made. If you have this empathy, even if you love Sigmund Rhee, perhaps you will be able to understand while others despise him. And if you despise Sigmund Rhee, but you have this sort of empathy, perhaps you can understand while others would admire him. Such empathy regarding Rhee and historical figures will certainly not magically hear Korea's political divides. But empathy as a practice might go some way to making these divides less rancorous and emotional and less disruptive and destructive to society. If the practice of empathy with historical figures becomes commonplace, it might be easier to practice empathy with those on opposite sides of current political issues that you disagree with, and it might be possible to find areas of compromise. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have.